stem cells, cloning, abortion, genetically modified foods. What should Christians think about these things? Controversies in the culture. Today's topic on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live, the program that summarizes the kind of information from creation.com, our website, right. and Creation Magazine. Uh, today, our, our focus is going to be on something a little bit different than the origins debate. Right. CMI employs PhD scientists, and our focus is on Genesis chapters 1 to 11, the creation versus evolution issue. Uh, but today, we're, it, it, we also try to branch out a little bit. If we're going to go into any topic, it's kind of general apologetics. Right. Uh, the origins debate, you know, when I'm speaking, I often use a, an example that, you know, philosophically there's those three big questions in life. So number one, where do we come from? And then what's the meaning of life? What happens when you die? And then I talk about how, you know, the question of origins is so foundational because it provides you a way of understanding those next two questions. But of course, uh, we hold to the, you know, the plain reading of scripture as Christians. So then, it should go beyond question number one. It, once you understand what that is, what your origin is, that the scripture is true, then that works into questions number two and number three. Of course, which yeah. gets into the hot topic issues. I guess we're gonna we're gonna talk about today and how Christians should then view uh, the 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 uh, topics we're gonna discuss. Right. Those are. It, it's a whole worldview that begins with what you think about where you came right. from, and so part of the, the a number of the the, the ideas that we're gonna look at today. Um, it, it, it basically has to do with the sanctity of life. A lot of the right. things that we'll look at today have to do with our, the worldview that we have about life, right. human life in particular, and how we relate to the world around us, animal life, plant life, and right. so on. Uh, when does life begin? We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. When does it end? The differences between animals and humans. Um, we, we kill animals to eat, but we don't kill people to eat. <laughs> if, well, if, most of us don't. You know, it, it, and, and, and cloning and genetically modified foods and stem cells, all of those things are the topic today on Creation Magazine Live. Does the Bible give clues as to how old the earth is? In Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus said, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. But if the universe is billions of years old, then Jesus' statement is false because people did not arrive at the beginning but close to the end. The chronogeonologies in Genesis 5 and 11 document that there was 2,009 years between the creation of Adam and the birth of Abraham. Since Abraham lived close to 2000 BC, this gives a date for the creation week of around 4000 BC. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Creation.com has grown to become the world's most powerful internet resource on the creation evolution issue. There are more than 6,500 articles already online and new articles are added daily. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood the age of the earth from both the Bible and science, scientific arguments against the Big Bang and models that explain observations in astronomy within a young earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution, and many more topics. These thousands of articles are available for free 24 hours a day to anyone on earth with an internet connection. Genesis is one of the most attacked areas of the Bible. Creation.com provides logical, scientifically accurate counterattacks in this area. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. 
Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. Where do cavemen fit into biblical history? Based on their evolutionary beliefs, most cavemen were primitive brutes on the way to becoming fully human. From the viewpoint of biblical history, after the confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel as people spread out, they would have lived in a variety of homes made of mud, stone, wood, tents, or in caves. The Bible describes a number of cavemen. In Genesis, we find that Lot was once a caveman, after he fled Sodom. When David ran from King Saul, he lived in a cave, and Job mentions people who lived in caves also. Thus, you would expect evidence all over the world that skillful, talented, and fully human people have lived in caves at various times. I suppose once we get into the, when we get into these topics here, some yep. of the things that we need to uh, need to settle at the onset is the differences between humans and animals. Okay. Uh, Worldview obviously has a say about that. If we just right. evolve from animals, then we kind of are animals. We are and, animals. And yeah. Where are the differences? So let's let's tackle that, and then we'll uh, we'll also look at uh, a question that a lot, a lot of people have: is you know, my, my my favorite cat Fifi or my dog Rover? When they die, are they going to be in heaven with me? Right. Right. Will yeah. animals go to heaven? So in this in this uh, in this episode, we're going to do a lot more reading from articles from the Journal of Creation, right. from Creation Magazine, and from the website. We'll just we'll just read that information here and uh, and answer those questions. Right. So this is from an article on the website called Animal Souls, Slaughter, and the Bible by Rebecca Holt, a, a guest uh, guest writer for our website. We may not have actual golden calves in the Western Hemisphere, but animal worship is still prevalent today. Mm. Media sources suggest that animals have immortal souls and live in a paradise after death. Probably everyone has had some animal, uh, animal make life a little brighter. Uh, not, I haven't had many animals, uh, but... Um, I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you still got some dogs today. Yeah. But, uh, I had monkeys uh, and everything. <laughs> but not all of us want to address whether good animals go to heaven or not. For Christian animal lovers like myself, this is Rebecca speaking, uh, it can be confusing and difficult to ask the question, just what does the Bible say concerning man and animal coexistence here on earth and eternal life beyond? Firstly, man was created in the image of God. When the animals were created on the sixth day of creation week, God was pleased with what he had done. He pronounced his work good. That's Genesis 1 verse 25. In Revelation 4, verse 11, we read that God created all living things for his pleasure. The Lord, however, was uh, desired that one of his creatures would ultimately uh, be able to commune with him and appreciate splendor, the splendor of his perfect creation. God created man in his image, Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Man and woman are created separate from the animals, Adam from dust and Eve from his side. Right. So there's a bit of a summary uh, Animals were not given the distinction of being, being made in God's image. Right. So there's already a strong hint from Scripture that there's a difference there. And even where the, uh, the woman was created from, from man, literally, from his, his side, and then you have the doctrine of, uh, and the two become one, you've got that kind of complete theology yes. <laughs> thing happening yes. there, which is and totally then, different from animals. And then, and then the differences as well, because we're created in the image of God, we're going to get into capital punishment a little bit later on, right. but uh, uh, we were... We were commanded that we could, we could kill animals but not kill people. That's right. Uh, as the article uh, states, God instituted animal slaughter. Um, it, it says in the article, it's crucial to remember that God himself was the first to slaughter an animal in order to clothe Adam and Eve after they'd sinned. Right? They, they, he gave them um, clothes to wear, uh, skins. After the flood in Genesis 9-3, God sanctions the human consumption of animal flesh. Every moving, living, uh, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. And, you know, before that, Genesis 1.29, it says you're only eating plants. Now, he says, no, as I gave you the plants, now you can have the animals. Um, in Old Testament law found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God institutes the extensive protocol of animal sacrifice. In this same law, the Lord decrees the criminal penal penalties for homicide and human sacrifice. Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, and by his death conquered sin, that through him the human race might obtain eternal salvation from death and separation from God. 
Because of Christ, the perfect lamb, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we no longer have to sacrifice animals. The sin penalty is paid in full. And that's, uh, of course, Hebrews 7, 27. So again, right there, in that same place yep. uh, where you, you hear about the, the, the sacrificial system and so on, there's, the, there's, when it talks about humans, no, you don't sacrifice humans. Right. Humans are different. Yes. We sacrifice animals as a payment for sin, as kind of that blood sacrifice and so on. Yep. And then ultimately, Jesus being the ultimate blood sacrifice. Right. Uh, but, but humans don't, you, you don't you sacrifice don't, humans. And, right. And, 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 and capital punishment is set up uh, as, um, uh, in that, at that same time. Right. right. So there are some of the differences yes. that are spelled out there. So the question then, that uh, do animals go to heaven? You know, there's the movie, Do All Dogs Go to Heaven? Do animals go to heaven? <laughs> it's covered in and the, the article. article covers that as well. Yeah, it says we have a sober responsibility to be good and kind stewards of the animals under our care. However, it's, it's so important to keep these creatures in their proper place in our affections. God never intended for a man to worship animals by giving them human characteristics or honoring them above other human beings. The Bible tells us that in eternity, Christians will live in continual bliss where there's no sin, no death. Scripture also declares that the Creator will create a new heaven and a new earth. Will God recreate new animals in heaven? The Bible doesn't tell us, actually. And animals are not mentioned. Uh, and now people will bring up the passages in Isaiah 11 and 65 about, her, you know, Herbert verse, uh, lions and wolves and lambs co coexisting um, peacefully. But this must be refer to a period of partial restoration um, into the new heavens and the earth because the description still refers to the death of people, um, even though they live to a ripe old age at that time. Right, so no animals in heaven. We'll be back. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Most evolutionists believe that two non-chickens mated and the DNA in their new zygote contained the mutations that produced the first true chicken. Unfortunately for evolutionists, the science of genetics does not support their claim. Geneticist Dr. Lee Spetner wrote, not even one mutation has been observed that adds even a little information to the genome. According to the Bible, chickens came first. God created a functionally complete universe. Adam and Eve were created as mature humans, complete with the ability to communicate with God and each other. Another one of those hot topics is genetically modified foods. Right. Are they safe to eat? Are these, are these Frankenstein foods? This article here is called Frankenstein Foods? Question mark by uh, Don Batten, one of our biologists over right. in Australia. Now uh, this is actually, this is from Creation Magazine. Now it's also been digitized. It's on our website, creation.com, but this is from the September 2002 edition. Most soybeans grown in the U.S. have one, have, have had a foreign gene from a microbe implanted in them. This enables the plants to tolerate a weed killing chemical. So the farmer can spray the whole field <laughs> and the weeds die, but the crops, uh, but not the crop plants. Uh, much of the maize, the corn, grown has, uh, has a gene for the microbial toxin, uh, for a microbial toxin that kills moth larvae that eat the ears of the corn. So here's, this is, this is part of what uh, right. is, is attempted with this genetic modification mm -hmm. to, to enhance the foods or disease or pesticide resistance, something like this. Right. Genetically modified foods come from plants or animals that have been genetically engineered to contain genes from organisms of basically a different kind such that the genes could not normally be incorporated through regular breeding techniques. For example, scientists in Australia engineered a pig to have a cow gene that produces cow growth hormone. The gene can be switched on or off by feeding or not feeding the pigs a certain amino acid in their food. <laughs> in this way, the pigs can grow faster and produce uh, the lean meat, the, the lean meat sought by consumers. Wow. All of this engineering requires considerable skill on behalf of the scientists involved, and for each success, there are many failures. That's a key point as well. Right. So I guess the, the big question then is, that, is these things exist? Right. We're, we're eating them right now, whether we want to or not? Yeah. Are they safe? That's the big question. And right. further, on, further down the article, this question is addressed exactly. Evidence is mounting that the control systems in plants and animal cells are much more complex than many of the practi practitioners of genetic mm. engineering anticipated. Right. Genetically modified foods have been considered basically safe on the basis that one gene produces one protein. Recent discoveries undermine these simplistic notions. 
Right. And this is something that, that you've even talked about in your, in, in, um, in, in your talk, Codes and Creation. Right. And it's mentioned further down in the article here as yeah, well. Yeah, they, they mention here in the article that the number of genes identified in the Human Genome Project, uh, about 35,000, is far less than the known number of human proteins, which is more than 100,000. And uh, in other words, there are many more proteins than there are genes to code for them. So the whole concept was, okay, well, there's one gene for one protein. That's not, in fact, true. We've got tremendous complexity in, in, the, in the, the blueprint of living things. So it's not just a, a linear code where you start here and go to here and that codes for a certain uh, information or protein and you go from here to here. What they're finding now is these things are overlapping. Right. And, and so, you, you, you know, that's called data compression. <laughs> it, it, it's pretty amazing, the, the DNA. And now you, they've found that you can, yeah, you might go from here, you go to here and that would code for something completely different. So you're reading backwards and it codes for something else. Right, and they're even thinking perhaps the way the, uh, you know, the, the DNA is compressed, maybe there's cross-coding going on, they, they're starting to unravel, it's just the complexity is just staggering. Even concepts like meta-information, much of the, the DNA is non-coding. This uh, non-coding DNA um, tells this, this stuff what to do, kind of like uh, akin to a, um, uh, if you're baking a cake and over here you've got, you know, here's the eggs, here's the butter, here's the milk, but then over here you've got instructions to tell you what to do with that. That, that's kind of an analogy right. to an amazing amount of information just to, to tell you what to do with the things that are, that are there. So by changing one thing to try to genetically mod modify something, you could be changing a whole lot of things. Right. So what's the conclusion? Well, the, the conclusion then is, in principle, there's nothing morally wrong with genetically modified foods, but in practice, uh, the person said, I believe that many of the efforts are dangerously naive. Testing needs to be very thorough to make sure genetically modified foods are indeed safe to eat. On the other hand, products that are not eaten, such as cotton, may demand less stringent testing. Such genetic genetically modified plants may enable, for example, a large reduction in pesticide use, which could be good um, for the workers and, and so on. Genetically Modified Foods, another hot topic addressed on our website. Mm. When Dr. Carl Whelan started Creation Magazine in his home in 1978, little did he realize that today it would reach into some 170 countries all around the world and have such a huge impact in so many lives. This unique 56-page, full-color family magazine refutes evolution and gives God the glory for the amazing creation we see around us. Creation Magazine is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page in Creation Magazine is chock full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for laypeople, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Many have come to faith in Christ because of subscribers sharing this magazine with them. So subscribing not only boosts your faith, it enables you to get biblical truth into your community in a special way. Subscribe today and have it delivered to your home every three months. Visit creation.com for subscription information or call the CMI office nearest you. Okay, well, let's tackle a very hot topic in, in the culture, and that's the, the issue of stem cell research. I mean, this, this is a big, big topic in the, in the news for sure. Um, I'm going to read a, an article here, or excerpts from an article by Jonathan Sarfany, and this is from our Journal of Creation. Um, this is Creation Magazine Live. Of course, we talk about Creation Magazine, our flagship publication, which is more of a lay person's understanding of these things. But the, our journal, if you're interested in that, you, you can go to our website and subscribe. And uh, in-depth uh, research and articles from many PhD yeah. scientists. So, um, uh, Dr. Sarfati says, um, <coughs> talking about what are stem cells, as the embryo grows, different cells in different places have to specialize so that only certain instructions are executed. Uh, the cells become differentiated. The instructions are there, but turned off somehow. So only certain information is turned on. 
However, stem cells are undifferentiated because they are like embryonic cells in that their instructions haven't been turned off. So they have the potential to grow into any type of tissue. This, this is the benefit of yeah, it, Yeah, right? hence tremendous medical benefits, right. possi a possible medi medical benefits. Yep. Therefore, many researchers have high hopes that they w could be used to regrow damaged tissue. They hope that it could help Parkinson's disease, insulin-dependent, uh, type 1 diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, and repair nerves damaged by sp uh, spinal injuries. So you can imagine, I mean, obviously, if we could help the people with, with these uh, ailments, this would be just fantastic. Yes. So where are the stem cells found? Well, the main controversy is the use of stem cells from aborted babies or especially cloned embryos. Embryonic stem cell research, um, these stem cells develop in the first few days after fertilization. But what has been largely overlooked are the many successes of treatments with stem cells not derived from embryos. And that's the controversy. And that's the controversy. Do we, do we grow little humans and then kill them? Again, it goes back to that worldview. The sanctity you know, of are life. Are we animals? Are we, what's the difference between animals and humans and so yep. on? Sanctity of life. Do we grow little embryos and then, and then kill them and harvest their stem cells? Right. Uh, to repair other humans, that kind of thing? Right. Um, Somebody that has um, you know, a spinal injury but they're an adult. Do they get to decide to kill a person that has absolutely no opportunity to defend themselves in order to right. the make the most innocent possible life that yeah, you they, think they, they of. can't defend themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the scientific issues and what are the ethical issues? I've got them summarized here. The scientific issues, stem cells are those with the potential to form into many different types of tissue, right? We can summarize yep. this. They're found not only in embryos but in many types of non-embryonic even adult tissue. Right. Um, adult stem cells. Yeah. That's right. Their potential for growing many types of tissue means that they show promise for treating many types of diseases and disabilities. The best treatments to date are from non-embryonic, so no little humans need to be killed, right. that is like adult, adult stem cells, with dozens of medical successes, and the best source so far, believe it or not, is liposuction fat. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you can get, people think that it, well, you can only get stem cells from, from embryos. Right, but that's, that's not, not true. true. You can get them from many different places. Uh, in, the, in the brain, in your nose, uh, hair follicles, the umbilical cord. Right. And rich you don't have to rich kill in stem cells, your bone marrow, and right. so on. Conversely, embryonic stem cells have had no successes and experiments show potential dangers. Lots of successes with adult stem cells, which is no moral problem. So why even go? to well, the moral problem, yeah, right? There, there we are, right? Embryonic stem cells closely linked with human cloning, which we're going to get to shortly, right. to avoid the problem of tissue rejection. Uh, that is a non, it's a non-issue from stem cells derived from the patient. Right. You can get stem cells from yourself to repair your own tissue. Right, and it's not going to reject it. The body's not going to think it's foreign exactly. tissue. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. The successes of non-embryonic stem cell treatment have largely been overlooked, as was mentioned in the article already. Mm -hmm. Some of the ethical issues. The Bible teaches that, human, that humanity starts at the beginning of biological life. Science supports this. When a fertilized egg is there, that's when human life begins. Right. Therefore, embryonic stem cell research and human cloning inevitably lead to the death of tiny human beings. Since murder, intentional killing of human life is wrong, it follows that embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, and induced abortions are wrong because they all involve the intentional killing of human embryos. Right. Justifying the killing of embryos for research or medical benefits will help dehumanize them in the eyes of the public and perpetuate the idea that one class of humans is expendable. Right. So there's, there's a summary of stem cells and the difference between embryonic and adult stem cells. Lots of advances with adult stem cells, none with embryonic stem cells. Right. There are many physical evidences on Earth to contradict the billions of years that evolution teaches, like the red blood cells and hemoglobin that have been found in an unfossilized dinosaur bone. Evolutionists believe that dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, but discoveries like this one contradict that belief. The Bible says that land animals, which would have included dinosaurs, were made on day six of the creation week. There is no contradiction between what the Bible says and evidence that dinosaurs lived recently. Well, we're back and we were just talking about stem cell research. And yes. You know, one thing I would like to, to make the point of is this. Now, you were talking about the fact that adult stem cells have they've been a great benefit and a help to people.
Lots of medical you know, successes. Yeah. Ethically, as Christians, we, we should look at the, the Bible ultimately as our foundation. You know, even if adult stem cells had no success, and there were tremendous successes as far as, you know, helping people from uh, harvesting, you know, uh, embryonic, uh, embryonic stem, stem yeah. cells, uh, the Christian stance should be no, then we would reject that because wrong. that would be killing uh, a, a, a person in order to help someone else. Yes. And that's, uh, yeah. the, you know, that, that would be wrong. Uh, Regardless of the success. Yeah, right. so we'll continue in that general area and talk yeah. about cloning. Right. Cloning, and, and, and obviously this, this is going to involve humans as well. Yes. Uh, so a little background information on cloning. This is from an article by Dr. Werner Gitt that appeared in Creation Magazine back in 1998. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just read excerpt, excerpts from it. Cloning is not a human invention. The Creator himself planned this as a way of reproduction. Strawberries are also propagated from runners, which are actually clones of the parent plant bearing fruit with the same color and taste. We also see cloning in the animal kingdom. Aphids can reproduce both sexually and by cloning. In the spring, the first aphid generation hatches out of fertilized eggs. Later, the aphid lays eggs that start to divide without being fertilized. Cloning. Hmm. They are clones of the mother. Many other animals reproduce by cloning, certain bees, ants, crustaceans, and lizards. I didn't even know that before this article. <laughs> Amazing. Concerning people, we know that identical qu twins are real clones. The fertilized egg splits in two, and each of these two daughter cells develops separately. They are individual people with an absolutely identical set of genes. Right. And so we've got cloning happening, uh, happening naturally. Um, now, what about human cloning? The Bible, however, draws a clear line between animals and humans and gives us ethical guidelines. Humans were created separately in God's image, unlike the animal kingdom, and there's, there's Bible verses that support that here in the article, Genesis 1.27, Luke 16-19, Philippians 1.23. God allowed humans to kill animals, Genesis 9, verse 2 and 3. Concerning other humans, he gave the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew there actually means murder, is, is the proper term for killing humans. Exodus 20, verse 13, you can, you can look that up. God entrusted humans with dominion over the animal kingdom, that's in Genesis 1, 26. But humans were never told to have dominions over other humans or to manipulate them, as would be the case in cloning humans. There are further reasons for rejecting artificial clone, cloning of humans. Each fertilized egg, including those from cloning, is a new human individual. Yet perfect, perfecting the cloning technique requires many experiments. And this is where the problem comes mm. in. Many individuals would be enabled to commence life only to be deliberately destroyed. So the conclusion is, thus while it may seem right, uh, while it may be right under certain conditions to clone animals to v benefit people, I think it's absolutely wrong to clone humans. That's the way Dr. Gitt ends his article. Right, right. Now, of course, the cloning issue, um, you know, there was that uh, discovery in 2005 where they, they found some unfossilized uh, uh, tissue inside of the, uh, the, the femur of a, of a tyrannosaur. And, of course, that caused great excitement because the first thing people thought of, of course, is Jurassic Park, right? Yes. Could, could we take could we this? Clone and a dinosaur from, <laughs> this, that from this blood cells and blood yep. vessels and tissue inside this dinosaur. That's right. And, and by the way, you know, recently uh, skeptics have tried to, uh, evolution have tried to combat this because it was such a, such a death blow to the theory of millions of years, right? Unfossilized tissue in a, in a supposedly 7 million, 70 million year old uh, dinosaur that they've started to say, well, maybe it was biofilm. Maybe bio it's just, film, it's just a uh, bacterial gunk. Yes. But yeah. uh, actually the evolutionist who founded, Mary Schweitzer, said you could sequence the amino acids from from <laughs> right from the, the so it, it was real dinosaur tissue. Could we clone from that? Right. Not the, the bottom line is not with the technology we have today. Right. You'd still need a living female dinosaur in which to put the uh, the, the, the right. egg and then get it started and so on. So. Uh, Dolly is is a famous example. Yeah. Dolly of, the sheep. Uh, the Dolly the sheep. The first clone of an adult sheep. So they took adult cells. Yeah. And they made a clone, and then they, 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 they energized those cells and put them in a, uh, in a female sheep, and then it, then it grew as, as it would normally grow. Right. But there's things on the ends of the genes called telomeres. Mm. And since they took adult, th these, these shorten over time, every time through cell division. And all, Dolly aged and died very quickly because she had shortened telomeres. Right. So that answers, or it's a potential answer for how people could live so long before the flood Maybe they had longer telomeres. Longer telomeres. So you have cell division many, many more times before you age and die. So that, that provided a clue 
as to uh, that mystery there in the Bible. How can people live to almost a thousand years? Right. Stones and Bones by author Carl Wieland. This popular 48-page booklet offers basic reasons for rejecting evolution in favor of creation. Easy to understand explanations on fossils, missing links, mutations, dinosaurs, natural selection, and more provide a high-impact apologetic book in a small package. As PhD scientist in immunology and molecular biology Miles Cooper stated after reading it, this little book overthrew 40 years of evolutionary indoctrination for me. It's in the news time again. What's happening in the news? Well, always stuff. And uh, of course, from our Creation Magazine, we have uh, reports all the time from things that our scientists will see, our speakers will see, and then they'll make comments on it. And I, I got to say, I, I love this kind of stuff. I love biology. I, I think it's my most, or microbiology is yeah, my most yeah. fascinating part of this debate. And I love <laughs> looking at what uh, God has done. But anyway, this, this one was about a virus motor. Um, and so let me just read you the article. It says, viruses are tiny, tiny particles that can't reproduce on their own, but hijack the machinery of truly living cells. But they still have a genetic material, long strands of DNA, or sometimes RNA, enclosed in a protein sheath. As one University of California researcher explained, the genome is about a thousand times longer than the diameter of the virus. It's the equivalent of reeling in and packing a hundred yards of fishing line into a coffee cup. <laughs> but Yikes. the virus is able to package its DNA in under five minutes. So we can actually reel this in and package it in five minutes. Uh, so how do they pack it in? The answer is in a packaging motor, which for its size is twice as powerful as a car engine. It can capture and begin packaging a target DNA molecule within a few seconds. The motor also manages to repair defects in the DNA as it packs. So it, it, it recognizes, oh, there's a pro and it's repairing it as it's doing its packing. Wow. Um, and even seems to be able to change speed. As the researchers say, just as it's good for a car to have, have brakes and gears, rather than only being able to go 60 miles per hour, the DNA packaging motor may need to slow down or stop and uh, wait if it encounters an obstruction. Life depends upon the long double-thread information molecule DNA, and it could not function without machines capable of dealing with such long double-threaded molecules. Yet the information for these machines is itself coded on the threads. Thus the code needs the machines, and the machines need the code. Life presents us with uh, many such chicken and egg problems for the, which naturalist theorist, uh, theorists have no answer. Creationists do have the answer. In the beginning, God created a fully functional chicken, which then laid an egg. Problem solved. And so, Amazing. Uh, you know, just you get little excerpts like this based on things that here, here's something that's in the news and so on, right. and, and, and something from uh, I don't know where this came from. The, the uh, uh, just National amazing. Academy of Sciences, actually. Yeah, new discoveries made about this this packaging motor and, and things. And, and we're not even into the into the magazine yet. No, this is just in the first couple of pages. Yeah, little short excerpts. But how 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 much can that build your faith and stuff? You think, man, that's isn't that amazing? You have this this uh, uh, motor and actually incredible. If you go to, if you go to our website, Dr. Sarfati did a whole article on this this little motor. And obviously, what are we getting at? Well. When I go out and I look at my car and I lift the hood and I see a motor and I see brakes and I see all the, I don't say, oh, it must have happened by chance. Right. Obviously, those right. things are indicators of a designer of a of an incredible nature. Yes, so, yeah. and 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 they're they're these virus things are what you said twice the power of a car engine. That's right. Size. Yeah. Amazing. There's some other things here uh, in this same issue. The secret of giving. This is again in the in the creation news and views section. Nature. Uh, Nature Journal described Japan as a country without alms, bemoaning the low level of charitable giving. It's a little bit different than, hmm. uh, you know, it's not science and creation evolution. Low level of charitable giving compared to Western nations such as the USA. Japan is a culture, quote, a culture in which individuals, rich or not, do not generally donate. Hmm. In the West, holding... In the West, holding a single fundraising event can raise millions of dollars, but fundraising efforts in Japan generally fall flat. Some Japanese organizations, such as the Kidney Foundation in Tokyo, have given up fundraising because they lose money on it. <laughs> in Japan, the locals admit the will, the will to give is weak. That's hmm. a quote from, from, the, from the article. The will to, will to give is weak. We previously reported, and this was uh, Creation Magazine number 4, 2007, uh, that certain Japanese authorities noticed their need for an organization like Samaritans in the UK, but how likely, 
But how likely is it that selfless Samaritan-like behavior can arise among a people unfamiliar with the famous parable? That's in Luke 10, 25. Right. You have, you have an organization called Samaritans. Well, what does that mean in a culture that doesn't, doesn't accept know what it's about? Scripture and that's where it comes from. Right. And other biblical injunctions encourage, encouraging generosity. Similarly, in the West, as the teaching of evolution theory undermines the biblical worldview, levels of giving are falling mm -hmm. as the proportion of Bible believers declines. Right. And it says here, see who really cares, creation 29.2 in 2007. And also, uh, you can look at our website, creation.com slash needy, N-E-E-D-Y, uh, for a fuller explanation of and, what the article is And again, about. the whole concept of your worldview and, and your religious view in, in, in terms, because I, I do believe that atheists and humanists have a religious view, a view Certainly, of where the universe yes. came from, etc. Um, for example, uh, the concept of karma. If you believe in karma, you know, if, if you your past life you did good things, then in your next life you're going to be doing good things. But... But if in your past life you did bad things, then, then you know, you're going to be suffering in, in your new life. Well, you know, you, you look at uh, cultures uh, such as India, for example, where people are suffering on the streets. People don't help them because the concept of karma is believed. So if you help someone who's in need, well, you're interfering, you're, with, you're interfering with karma. They, they should be allowed to suffer for what their, their sins in the past right. life. And, and if you help them, that's actually going to damage your own karma. So you should just let people suffer. Well, that stems from your religious views. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, anyway. We have time for one more? Let's do one more. Let's hope so. Dinos could breed when young. It's another, another uh, something in the news here. Researchers have found that fossilized egg-making tissue in young juvenile female dinosaurs. They found egg-making tissue in these dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, this is Allosaurus and Ten Tenontosaurus. They've got all these different names for these things. Tenontosaurus. From growth rings inside the fossilized shin bones, the researchers calculated that the two specimens were aged 8 and 10, very young for these dinosaurs, <laughs> which lived about to about 30 years of age. Accordingly, these dinos could breed long before they reached adult size. On this basis, the dinosaurs that came off the ark did not have to first grow to full size before being able to multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number, up and increase in number upon it. So again, here's... Here's another little, right? This is just a wee little article, yep. and it helps us to flesh out some of those 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 answers to, to things where we might have probably, you know, okay, dinosaurs got off the ark after the flood. Right. How could they repopulate to any significant degree? Well, they could probably do it fairly quickly. Right. And and what size were they when they went on the ark and and all these these questions that we get every yes, time we go yes. out. And <laughs> Young dinosaurs, small dinosaurs go on the ark. A year later, they get off the ark, and presto, they're ready to, to, to start repopulating, as right. the Bible says, and, 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 re, re, and fill the earth. Yeah. And, of course, what we, we like to do is we like to take excerpts from uh, evolutionary magazines. And this is what we're doing. We're using the, the information that they're doing research on and showing, yes, that's actually a help to the Christian biblical worldview uh, rather than to their own. It fits with the Bible. Right. And we'll be back. Jesus, the Creator. Jesus Christ, who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, is also the Creator of the universe. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. Also in John 1.3 we read, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is the Creator God. Not only does Scripture confirm it, but during his earthly ministry, Jesus did things only the Creator God could do. Frankenstein Foods and Fetuses by presenter Dr. Don Batten. Modern technology has brought us many positive scientific breakthroughs, but it has been a cause of concern for many as well. How should Christians think about such things in light of the clear teachings of Scripture? For example, is the genetic modification of our foods ethical, safe, wise, biblical? What about cloning and stem cells? And how have researchers been influenced by evolution? In this ultra-topical presentation, plant physiologist Don Batten gives us plenty to chew on as he examines these hot topics. Capital punishment.
refreshment. There's another hot topic. There's a happy one. <laughs> There's a happy one, yeah. And, and this, again, this has to do with the sanctity of life, right? And that biblical versus that evolutionary worldview. Mm -hmm. You're going to come to different conclusions about capital punishment depending on what you think about where you came from. Right. The image of God, how does that relate to humans? How does it relate, what, what if you destroy the image of God? What are the Is there a God? If there's no God, we get to make our rules anyway. Certainly. Yep. All those kinds of things. Yes. So we have, um, uh, well, I, I guess the, the first thing we could say is that, uh, uh, we all we all get capital punishment, uh, ultimately. As in, uh, biblically, where do you stand in relation to your Creator? <laughs> as a no, sinner, as, in, as in, we all die, right? All of us eventually die, right? But uh, maybe a little bit beside the point. We, we've got an article here, and <laughs> if you could read that there on on capital punishment, yeah. and government, and so on. And again, this is from our our journal, so it, it's a much uh, you know longer article that would be in Creation Magazine, but it, it's great. It's called the Christian Foundations of the Rule of Law in the West. A Legacy of Liberty and Resistance Against Tyranny, and this is by Augusto Zimmerman. And uh, so here's some excerpts. He says, the reasons for a civil government. Um, the first reference to civil government is in the Holy Scriptures, uh, found in uh, chapter 9 of the book of Genesis. In this chapter, God commands capital punishment for those who take the life of human beings, uh, who are always created in the image of God. In this sense, the right to execute murderers does not belong to government officials themselves, but to God who is the author of life and commands the death penalty for murder in several passages of the Holy Scriptures, Exodus 20, uh, 21, 12, Numbers 35, 33, etc. Thus, life can only be taken away from the individual if civil authority is applied under God's law and commission as the sanctity of human life as, uh, is the basis on which God sanctions capital punishment. As John Stewart explains, capital punishment, according to the Bible, far from cheapening Human life, by requiring the murderer's death, demonstrates its unique value by demanding an exact equivalent to the death of the victim. Uh, big difference between what you'll you'll find some people who don't agree with capital punishment to be saying, right? They're yes. they're concerned about well, we got to save this person's life even though he's committed it, but what about the victim? Uh, that's that's what this is making the the point of. So uh, it goes on and says the state is a necessary evil. Now we live in a sin cursed world that has to be subject to God's higher laws. After sin entered into the world, it became necessary to establish the civil government in order to curb violence. However, the state was not in, in, envisaged in God's original plan for mankind, as it places some people in a position of authority over others. At the beginning of the creation, however, Genesis tells us that man and woman lived in close fellowship with God under his direct and sole authorship, uh, authority. So that puts things in perspective for the Christian as to the whole concept of capital punishment. Is God for it? Is God against us? Uh, yes. That, that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, it seems pretty clear from Scripture there as, as talked about in this article. Another thing we could, we, well, that's very different than, we could, we could mention that it's a very different perspective than uh, folks of another world you may have. But even folks who are Christians, yes. and so in support of capital punishment, it's often seen, or I, I've heard it, Talked about as as a type of revenge. Well, right. that's the that's the just penalty. And he's he's you 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 you, you murdered someone. You, it, it's revenge. It's, mm -hmm. it's a type of. But properly understood, it's not just about revenge. It, we do that because God commanded us to do it. Right. And and he's the one who made the laws, the rules, and uh, the state is, is is representative in that in that situation. Right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Another hot topic in the culture today. In an effort to imply that biblical writers were primitive, many people have said that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat. Even though the round shape of our planet was an obvious conclusion when watching ships disappear over the horizon and by observing eclipse shadows, what does the Bible say? The implication of a round earth is seen in the New Testament, where Jesus described his return. In Luke 17, 31, Jesus said, In that day, then in verse 34, in that night, this is an allusion to light on one side of the globe and darkness on the other simultaneously. In the Old Testament, we read in Isaiah 40, 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Inspired by their creator, the earth shape was well known to biblical writers.
these things have to do, the hot topics in the culture have to do with the sanctity of human life. I think the top one is uh, on everyone's mind already, abortion. Right. Um, the killing of people before they're born. Yes. Obviously, that's our position. I've given away the, the conclusion. Shouldn't, shouldn't be much of a surprise. Yeah. Uh, it really has to do with when does life begin? That's one of the first arguments that needs to be uh, needs to be determined, and the Bible speaks on this in many different places. It's probably it, it's probably uh, the most clear in Psalm 139, verse 13, which says, "You formed my inward parts; you knitted me together in my mother's womb." The author there is talking about I was an individual when I was in before birth, right. when I was being knit together. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there was an article done on our website by by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, but it was a, a review of a book written by a man named Francis Beckwith. And um, so that, that's the context here, and uh, here's uh, an excerpt from the introduction. Abortion has been one of the most difficult or important ethical if issues in Western society for the last three decades. Many people, sadly including many Christians, think abortion is a difficult and controversial issue, but there should be no difficulty or controversy at all there are only two issues to consider. And one is the one you mentioned, is the, um, is the unborn child uh, a human being? Of course, they use the, right. the technical term fetus, but you can call it whatever you want. It is a human being. And if so, is it ever acceptable to kill the unborn? That's fairly simple. If you answer those two questions, yeah. you should yeah. be able to make a decision about this issue, right? The answer to both questions is clear from the Bible, starting in Genesis. Genesis 20, uh, 25, 21 to 22 states, And Rebekah, his, which is Isaac's wife, conceived, and the children struggled together within her. Note that Rebekah's unborn twins, Jacob and Esau, are referred to as children. They're not referred to as fetus or something other than, yeah. than people, right? Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the Hebrew word used, banim, is the usual word for sons after birth. Right. Okay, so the same so, word there is being used for children after birth right. and before birth. Yeah, what's the same difference thing. between when you're inside and outside the womb? Right. Unborn babies are not disposable clumps of tissue, despite the claims of many pro-abortionists, and they are always human right from fertilization, because all the DNA coding needed to build each individual's physical features is there in the fertilized egg. It is absolutely false that the developing human goes through any fish or reptile stage. We, we talked about this on a, on a previous show. And uh, despite some blatantly fraudulent evolutionary claims, um, no, the Bible, supporting by, supported by science, teaches that the unborn baby is a human child. Um, and there's some other uh, scripture reference there. And supported by science uh, as well. I That's mean, right. You, ha you have mama and dad, uh, you know, DNA coming together. At that point, it's a unique code for a fully functional human being at that That's point, right. right from conception. That's right. The second question is also answered consistently throughout Scripture, again starting from Genesis. Genesis 1, 26 to 29 and 2, 7 to 23 make it clear that man was created distinct from the animals, made in God's image. Only one generation later, Cain committed the first murder, a destruction of this image, thus a grievous uh, affront to God. After God judged mankind's violence in the global flood of Noah's day, God instituted the death penalty for murder precisely because it destroys this image of God. Right. The article a little bit later, I'll just continue on here. Uh, Beckwith, the, the, uh, the book review, is, is talking about uh, this book by Francis Beckwith, right. Dr. Francis Beckwith. Beckwith already anticipated some, uh, some uh, arguments such as identical twins prove that life doesn't begin at conception. Right? And then, then his, his response to that, Francis Beckwith's response to right. that is this. Twinning may be a form of asexual reproduction where one embryo divides into two, but this doesn't mean that she slash he wasn't an individual before then. Right. Right. Another argument. The early embryo doesn't look human. And his response is, yes, it does, just, just the way it should look at that age. Okay. Also, appearances are, uh, appearances are defective. Statues and store mannequins look human, but are not. Abnormal-looking humans, like the elephant man, are still human. Right. right? Appearances can be deceptive. Um, another argument. Most zygotes never make it to term. Okay, that, that's an abort a pro-abortion argument. Right. His response is, all humans have virtually 100% mortality rate. Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> but this doesn't mean it's okay to actively murder someone. Every human will die. Right. That doesn't mean it's okay to murder them before they're born. Right. Another argument. The pseudo-biblical argument that the account of Adam's creation shows that life begins when breathing starts. 
And his response is this. First, unborn babies do breathe, or at least respire, just not through their lungs. Secondly, the creation of Adam and Eve was a special case. Neither of them had mothers or came from an embryo, so right. it's illegitimate to extrapolate from their example. It would be just as illogical to claim that since life since they began lives as adults, human life today doesn't begin till adulthood. Right. And it's, it, it's many of these arguments that are, uh, that are dealt with uh, in this book, this book review that's here on the, on the web. Mm -hmm. There's other articles, and uh, we're not going to have time to go through all of this. This is, this is a, quite an in-depth article. You can look it up on our website, creation.com, Refuting Contrived Pro-Abortion Arguments. You want to do a search on that? Yeah. Uh, you'll you'll find it, it's a very extensive article again by uh, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati and Lita Costner, right. a former evolutionist who went to the website and was dramatically affected. Now she writes articles for us. Yeah. It's just tremendous. Lots of information on abortion and why it is not the biblical root for Christians or for anyone. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at Creation.com. Creation scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 6,500 articles, many of which appeared in leading creationist publications like Creation Magazine and the Journal of Creation, over more than 30 years. When news breaks about the latest evolutionary ape man or some major supposed evidence for evolution, check out creation.com for a Christian creationist response. Each weekend, the website features a feedback article, response to a web visitor's email feedback. Often, the anti-creation arguments in skeptics' emails are refuted in a detailed response by a CMI staff member. So in a very practical way, believers can see that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, can be defended against the skeptics' arguments. The website includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs, and related materials. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. Thanks, Mark. The feedback section of the, the, the show, we're... Uh People who've uh, written into our to our website or responded to us in some way, where they've got a question or, or something like that, and of course the issue of abortion um, generates much uh, controversy and questions. So here's a um, here's some excerpts from a, a letter written to us. Um, the person says, "I have a couple of questions regarding abortion and ethics. First, how does one present an effective argument for God-given absolutes?" fully applicable to modern society, to a person who believes that no one should impose his beliefs on other people. The response was, uh, first, always try to discern the hidden assumptions behind your opponent's beliefs. Right? The person tries to bluff you into thinking that it's a question of whether one should impose one's beliefs on others. However, all laws impose morality. Laws against right. murder and rape impose on murderers and rapists the moral view that murder and rape are wrong. In, real, in reality, the only question is whose morality should be imposed. The pro-abortionist has no qualms about imposing his pro-abortion morality on the unborn babies. So what this hypothetical person really means is that he doesn't want Christian morality imposed on him or her, and uh, that he or she doesn't want to impose... Uh, not that he or she doesn't want to impose a humanist morality on the unborn baby if that baby has committed the capital crime of being unwanted. I think that's a great point because people need to recognize the fallacy in someone's argument right off the bat or else you start arguing on the wrong path and yes. you've been led down the, the garden trail. And that's done so often in this Friday feedback section. Yes. It's actually archived on the website. You can go to creation.com and go to the feedback section. They're archived there from all the Fridays going back for years. <laughs> that's right. Uh, where, where we've responded like this to, to uh, feedback. That's right. Uh, the person said, well, I talked to the Democrat a couple weeks ago who claimed to believe that human life begins at conception but said that she can't impose her beliefs on other people through laws against abortion. Well, the response we had was, often a faulty moral argument can be refuted by an astute substitution. Her argument is just like, I believe that slaves are truly created equal, but I can't impose my anti-slavery beliefs on slave owners through laws against slavery. I mean... Sounds a little different when you, when you, when you substitute, substitute right. that in. Once you've got a culture that agrees, well, yeah, slavery is not, not right. 
and you just make the same steps. Oh, well, that changes a bit. Well, why can't you do it in the same way? Should we as Christians really be accepting these pseudo arguments against what we truly believe uh, God has said is, is wrong? Right. Yep. Um, uh, it goes on and says, I then asked her if she believed that God had the authority to make moral judgments, and while she implied that he, uh, she did, she said that she does not want to impose her religion on other people either. And then uh, we said, but she's willing to allow humans to impose their religion on the unborn. See, that's the, that's the, that's the case. Are we going to stand up as Christians and say, hey, this is what God said, or are we just going to kowtow to what the humanist religion is, is, is imposing on our society. Right, and understanding how these arguments break down right. is really going to help see that, wait a minute, the, 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 the humanists are arguing from the same perspective. We're trying to impose a morality, a biblical morality, yeah. not, not our own, but, yeah. but, but, but God's, yeah. and they are trying to impose one as well. That's it's right. not that we're trying to impose something and they're not. That's right. Uh, they, they certainly are. See, this issue has far-reaching consequences because we've gone from the days when we're, we're, we're arguing about, oh, well, is it really a person yet? You know, first trimester, second trimester. Well, we abort babies at nine months. We, we have partial birth abortions. Yeah. And, and this is legal in the Western world. Well, now, um, you know, I use an article I, I pulled off the Internet in uh, 2004 um, called Does History Repeat Itself? And, and it's talking about the, this, this hospital um, over in Europe that's killing babies after the, the day after they're born. If they've got a birth defect or something like that, they kill them. And, you know, I've got a, a quote from um, Peter Singer, the, the professor of bioethics at Princeton University, yes. who says killing a disabled infant is not morally equivalent to killing a human. Very often it's not wrong at all. Well, I can imagine there's, you know, many people watching this show that know a family with someone with a disability. What he's advocating is, well, they've got a disability, they're not as, as, as human or, or as equal to every, uh, you know, other people, just kill them. Not wrong to kill them. He actually advocates a 28-day time period after a child's born, whether the parents get to decide to kill it or not. So there you are, the child's yeah. born, 27, 28 days, well, let's kill it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the abortion argument uh, taken to its next logical step. And it's happening. I mean, and it, 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 it's, it's happening. So That's Christians, right. we need to take a stand on this issue. There's another feedback here that we can look at. Uh, this one's t uh, entitled, Inf Offended by the Term Baby Killers. Uh, I'm sure if you do the search baby killers on our website, creation.com, you uh, uh, you'll be able to find this. I was saddened to read the euthanasia and abortion section on your site using emotive terminology such as baby killers is very disrespectful to those who do not share your views. Uh, <laughs> and, and our response is, it's simply stating a fact. Abortionists are killing human babies. They're not chopping up jellyfish. Alas, pro-abortion propaganda conveniently, conveniently forgets that there's another person involved. That's right. Uh, and it goes on from there. Uh, offended by the truth is what they're saying. Offended by the truth. And yeah, that's, um, I mean, you just, you just kind of shrug your shoulders and say, well, that's, that's uh, we're offended by some of their truths as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you, this this article goes on to, uh, if you substitute in, as we did ju just previously, substitute in, instead of slavery, substitute in the two-year-old yeah. instead of the, the, the one in the baby. And it goes on, and, and you'll have to, uh, uh, we're out of time, so you'll have to read that uh, on the website. But these are the, these are the hot topics of the culture. The mm -hmm. Bible has something to say about it.